Warning! Tube amplifiers have lethal voltages inside them. Please do not attempt to build, test, or repair these without understanding and following all safety protocols. Hey y'all! Well, the new potentiometer came in, so we're ready to get that installed, do some testing, some stress testing, make sure that this new potentiometer is up to the task. I'm pretty sure it is. And then see what the final results are of all this stuff. I'm excited to see how this thing finishes up. I think this is going to be a really awesome little preamp. So let's get busy. Okay, so I'll show you the inside of my latest modifications, which was replacing the output volume control with this Borns half watt unit. 10K audio taper. Got the RCA jack ground in the positive and then the coupling cap hooks up here and the same underneath and this isn't perfectly ideal wiring but kind of retrofitting this smaller potentiometer in so this is perfectly functional nothing wrong with this you can see these caps are huge I ended up gluing them to the sides of the chassis here to give them some support and then one lead comes over here, this lead comes over here to this terminal, and then they go to the ends of the potentiometer there. So that's what the inside looks like now with these big output caps. And again, these are the trimmer potentiometers for the input that we added. So let me show you one other thing too. Somebody asked this question. Someone asked, what are you loading this with? And the viewer that's interested in buying this sent me the specs to their solid state power amps and they have a 20K input impedance. So we made up these little guys with a 20K 3 watt resistor to an RCA jack and just plug them in like this and there's the load for the output. So we have some idea of what this thing's going to work like with a 20K load on it. So let's hook this thing up to the audio analyzer suite again and hopefully get some final measurements. And I think I am going to put it back on the scope. I want to see what the 100 hertz square wave looks like with the bigger capacitors. So let's get busy testing. Okay, so we've got the new and improved version with the higher rated potentiometer on the output which should eliminate the problem we had in the last video and let's see what this thing does now as far as frequency response I've got the amp set at unity gain which is where I feel most folks will end up running this amp we've got the input potentiometers attenuating about 10 to 15 percent of the signal and the output volume pots a little over halfway up. And there's our missing low frequency response we had or didn't have with the 1UF coupling cap. The 6.8 cleanly goes down to 20 Hertz and doesn't really start rolling off till way down here at 10 Hertz so at 20 Hertz we have less than a quarter of a DB down which is just infinitesimal and as you can see we've got 0.1 DB up at 10k that's a flat frequency response you're not gonna hear that that's not gonna sound bright that's not going to sound rolled off on the bottom end. That's as flat as you could expect to see out of a tube preamp. And I'm super happy with the way this response curve looks now. And there's a pull at three quarters volume and you can see the response is totally flat there as well. So let's do one last one at a quarter volume. And there's the frequency response curve at a quarter volume. So, as you can see, 
changing the volume is not impacting the frequency response curve. I know that there was a lot of talk on the DIY forum about how having the potentiometer on the output is going to have huge impacts on the frequency response curves as you adjust the volume and as you can see unfounded claims it has absolutely no impact that's going to be audible on the frequency response so the next thing I want to show you that was very interesting to me here's the THD versus frequency now with the larger output cap and if you remember before we had a couple of percent of distortion here on the low end and it you know tapered down till it got down to about a hundred Hertz and then it was flat with this larger coupling cap it's one percent distortion completely even across the board which honestly I wasn't expecting that change but here we are it definitely flattened out the distortion versus frequency response on this preamp to what I would love to see which is a perfectly flat one so we're going to do one last test here on the audio analyzer suite we're going to attenuate down the input signal and we're going to turn up the output signal and we're trying to get this 2 volts RMS out with 2 volts RMS in unity gain and see what the THD versus frequency is doing this and once again you see if you look at the voltage here in this corner here we've got 2 volts RMS out so we've got unity gain with this setting as well but the difference here is we lowered the signal going into the preamp and increased the output volume control and now we've got 0.2% distortion across the whole range. So you can see with this preamp, you can dial in how much distortion you want to have injected into your signal by adjusting the input attenuators versus the output volume control, which I think is just super cool that you're able to do that with this preamp so next I want to put this thing on the scope I want to see what the 100 Hertz square waves look like now that we have these larger output caps and I think we're going to see the same thing that we're seeing here that the low end distortion has just disappeared putting these larger output caps in and again the frequency response is just awesome so let's do one last pull here with the distortion minimized at unity gain by attenuating the input signal and increasing the output same frequency response so once again I'm not sure if people just weren't thinking through how this potentiometer and the output cap interact but it's not changing the frequency response at all as we use different volume settings on both the input and the output and we still have a very flat frequency response curve even with the low distortion setting of the amp so let's get this thing on the scope get that last test and get ready to wrap up this series okay we got the preamp back on the scope and we've got our sine wave being injected and we got a one volt per division so let's turn the amp down and we'll get our two volts RMS in which is 5.6 volts peak to peak so there's one two three four five that's right at 5.6 volts peak to peak so we'll switch this back to 2 volts for division just to kind of get this up out of our way. So we got our 2 volts RMS in. We have our 10x probe enabled with this set on 10 volts per division. And let's crank this thing up and see if we see any clipping. And there's wide open with 2 volts 
RMS in. And we've got, again, 10X probe enabled. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. About 55 volts peak to peak on our output, which is pretty freaking hot. And there's no clipping. So let's see what it takes to make it clip. There we go. There it's starting to clip. And so let's see what that will take. Volts peak to peak on the input to get it to clip. That's one, two, three, four, five. A little over six volts peak to peak is where the clipping happens. So that's the same as it was before. So we haven't changed where the amp clips, but it can handle two volts RMS without clipping. And once again, These signals just overlay right on top of each other. I mean, you can see that that's a nice, clean signal. So, we didn't lose anything going to the larger cap. But we did gain the low frequency response, and we should see that on the square wave. So, let's switch this thing over to a square wave. And there's it, 1K. And that looks beautiful. No ringing. Everything looks good to go. Let's jump up to a 10K signal. Again, square wave looks beautiful. See nothing there to be concerned about at all. That's a nice square wave. So let's go down to 100 hertz since that's where we were seeing the problems before. And again, you can see here, my old analog signal generator is struggling to get a really clean square wave. But I don't know if you remember, these were like super angled before on the output. And you can see now, they're mirroring the input from my signal generator. One for one. And so going to that larger coupling cap, totally cleaned up the square wave on the output at 100 hertz as well. So I think this is a win. Okay, so let's go over the schematics and the design of this one last time. There were a few changes along the way and this is the final version. So we start over here at the power plug. First you have the fuse, then the switch. It's important to put the fuse first so that if the switch shorts out, the fuse will blow. Then it goes to the primary of the transformer and back to the neutral on the switch. The ground here goes straight to the chassis with its own connection, independent of the star ground point. Okay, over here we have a 500 volt center tapped transformer. The center tap goes to the star ground point, which all these caps also ground to. We have the rectifier 2, which is a 6.3 volt, which is powered up by the 6.3 volt winding, just like the 12 AU7s are. So then we have a 33 UF 450 volt cap. We have the choke. We have this R1 resistor. And then we have two 47 UF capacitors. And this is our 470K bleeder resistor. So the transformer I used in the video is no longer being manufactured by Hammond. And so this is the one that I'm recommending you use. It's a Hammond 269 that's in 115 and 125 volt. And if you need the 230, 240, 220 volt, you know, for Europe or other parts of the world, you want to get this 369JX. You can use any transformer you want. If there's someone in your country that has toroidal transformers or, you know what I'm saying, just the main thing you need here is a 500 volt center tap. This Hammond is a 69 milliamp. 
you need at least 40 milliamps on the 500 volt winding. So then you have the 6.3 volt winding. This Hammond's at 2.5 amp. You can add up the values of the heaters on this, but I believe you're going to need at least about 2 amps on the 6.3 volt. The choke we used was a 154M Hammond. It's a 2 Henry at 100 milliamps. Again, you really only need about 40 milliamps or so of current through the choke. This one's got a DC resistance of 175 ohms. Okay, this R1, the reason it's not labeled up here on the schematic is you want something around 2K ohms, but you're going to adjust the value of this resistor to get 300 volts here on the output with all the tubes in place warmed up and powered up. So when you buy this 2K resistor, I would recommend buying some on both sides of this value so you've got some adjustments and all the resistors in the power supply, I would just buy two watt ones. Also, the transformer that I used had a center tap on the 6.3 volt winding that we could just ground. This Hammond does not have a center tap. No worries, just get a couple of 100 ohm resistors and you create this virtual center tap that we connect ground. Now in an earlier video I talked about possibly needing to raise this above zero potential because of the cathode to heater voltage issue. Well, it's not really an issue. When I read more clearly the data sheet, 200 volts is what the heater to cathode can be. And so, not an issue at all that we've got the almost 100 volts on the cathode of one of those tubes, and then this is just grounded, plus the amp is totally silent with these AC heaters with the center tap grounded. So just ground the center tap. That should take care of the power supply. So let's move on to the schematic. And again, this was inspired by Matt's design at CascadeTubes.com. You can visit their website. There'll be a link in the description. But I did change a few things. One of the main things we did was we installed 100K pots on the input jacks, one on each channel. And what these allow is attenuation of the input signal to adjust the amount of distortion that the preamp creates. Got a one meg resistor here as a fail safe in case this pot goes open that we've always got a grid to ground reference. On the cathode of this input tube, I used a 2.2K mainly because that's what I had in my box of resistors. You could use a 2.4K like Matt did. If you do use a 2.4K, you're going to see more like 7 volts here. With this 2.2K, I saw 6.5 volts. Okay, we got 300 volts coming in here. We got this 51K plate load resistor. We got 150 volts onto the plate of this tube. So we're dropping half the voltage across this plate load resistor. I installed a 1K grid stopper on the grid of the tube. Then up here, we have a 0.1 UF coupling cap. I used Mundorf aluminum oil, one of my favorites. You can use whatever flavor you would like, but that's the same as the one Matt spec. So we come over here, we got another 1K grid stopper going to the grid of the cathode follower section of the tube you're going to see 86 volts on the cathode of this tube we got a one meg resistor here that comes down that's between the 1k and 10k resistors that create a little voltage divider here and this is creating the negative bias for the grid of this cathode follower 
So then straight off the cathode, we have this output coupling cap. And this was another thing that I changed. Matt had specced a 1.0 UF cap. And if you're not looking for super low frequencies, I'm sure that will work fine. Especially if you got speakers that only go down to 40 hertz or so, a 1 UF will work. But if you're planning on hooking up a sub or you're wanting you know, to get some really low frequency response out of this thing, use this 6.8 UF. If you got somewhere in between, you could try a 4.7 or a 2.2. So we've gone over that in the video, but this was the other change that I made was I put this larger output coupling cap. We added this one meg resistor across the output so that in case something goes wonky here with this pot, you're never going to end up with voltage on the output. The last thing is this 10K pot that's on the output. I've discovered that you need something at least 50 milliwatt rated. You're seeing about 40 milliwatts across this pot, and I end up putting in a half watt potentiometer just to be on the safe side. 250 or a quarter watts probably fine, but be careful with some of these pots that are made for the input signal, like I believe those blue velvet pots are only good for about 50 milliwatts, which is really close to what this thing could put out in a max output situation. Now in real life use, you're probably not going to see those types of wattages going across this resistor. But as I was stress testing mine on the scope, blasting the two RMS in with everything wide open, it was clearly more than this pot could handle and it smoked it. Don't know what the rating was, but I'm going to assume it was probably about a 20 milliwatt and it got annihilated. So just be aware of that. that this needs to be probably at least a quarter watt to be safe. And there's the output jack. The other thing to note that the input and output jacks do need to be isolated from the chassis. And this is all brought back to the same star ground point that is used in the power supply. And then for this cap, I ended up using a 50 UF 16 volt audio note cap that I ordered the same time I was ordering these 1 UF and 6.8 UF Mundorf aluminum wall caps. And those audio note caps are really nice and they're less than five bucks a piece. I think they're actually less than three bucks a piece. So while you're ordering these nice coupling caps, go ahead and order you a nice cathode cap for this amplification tube because it's important given that this is in the signal path. So I think that kind of covers all this. Let's wrap up this series. Well, as you can see, this little preamp does everything that I expected it to and set out to do, and then some. I know I've learned a lot about preamps, distortion, how to make things sound the way you want them to, and there is a way to get there from here. Previously, I wasn't a really big fan of preamps. I was like, why are people using these things? And I still feel that way for the vast majority of the preamps that are out there on the market. To me, this one's different. This one is more of a harmonic distortion manipulation device than an actual preamp. Although it can be used to drive power amps that don't have any volume controls on them. And I'm impressed enough with this where while this one that's sitting here in front of me has been spoken for by a viewer who asked me to build something like this for them months ago and I'm happy to get this thing in their hands. I'm going to build one for myself, probably in a little different format, you know, maybe in a little narrower chassis, you know, the same length and compact things a little bit. And I'm not sure if I'm going to use wood. I might just use your basic Hammond metal chassis like most of my stuff's built in. I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of 
space constrained on where I can put equipment like this without stacking it up and you can't really stack tube gear so I'll have to figure that out but I definitely want to use one of these to drive the KT120 monoblocks. I think this is ideal for it. I feel like in the past the KT120s and the KT88s especially but probably the KT120s too they sound a little crisp if that makes sense and I like the mellower sound of the EL34 but for some uses and some speakers they really just don't have enough power and so that's why I'm building these KT120s and something like this would allow me to adjust the tone of the sound that it produces by varying the harmonic distortion that's injected between the source and the amplifier. So this is definitely on my project list to build another one of these. And while I didn't show every test that I did on this thing and didn't show, you know, the 20 minutes of stress testing with a 2 volt RMS signal going into this thing wide open, I also tested the frequency response with a three foot cable from the output jack to the load. And still didn't see any high frequency loss. And hook this thing up to you know the amplifiers that I have here. Of course I don't have every amplifier made on the planet. And no I don't have any amplifiers that have a 5k input impedance or a 2k input impedance. And I don't think there's but a handful of those ever made on the planet. So, you know, there's possible some extreme case scenarios where this preamp won't work the way it's designed. And just a heads up warning, you know, I'm not claiming that this thing will work with 30 foot cables across the room to your amplifier. You know, that, that's likely to be an issue too. But in normal use with this near the amplifier and you know with two foot cables and a reasonable input impedance amplifier this thing's gonna rock and roll i really hope you enjoyed this series this is one of the the cooler things and one of the more educational projects that i've done since i've been doing this channel and if you do like this content please subscribe to the channel and like the video I also want to thank my Patreon supporters. You guys are what make a lot of this possible, as well as you folks that toss me a donation every once in a while. I super appreciate that, and that's what really inspires me to keep going. So, anyway, until the next project, have a nice day.